Today I'm having a rest from flying and I'm going to build this little LED decorative effects unit. I do love receiving these packages from China. You never really know what you're going to receive. As is the norm, we have a plastic bag full of random components. USB lead for power. A rather nice black PCB. See all the traces there, it looks quite complex and all the component positions. Apart from the LEDs, there appears to be very little, apart from the main controller chip. We shall see. A Perspex base, I guess. We have a multitude of multicoloured LEDs. These are the three RGB in one type units. And what do we have here? We have the master control IC. Can't quite make out what number that is at the moment some hardware, screws and nuts, and just three other components. A resistor, an electrolytic capacitor, 100 microfarad, 16 volts, a little ceramic capacitor, 104, so that's 10,000 picofarads, and a mini USB for the power, I guess. No instructions with the kit, however, on the web page, as always, links down in the description there, there are some installation notes. Without further ado then, let's get on and start the assembly. To begin then, it recommends putting in the resistor, which is 1 megohm. It has the 5 band colour code on it, which can be a little difficult, especially when you're starting out, to decipher. So I like to use this little component tester that I built. So we'll link up there to that project and that confirms that it's a thousand kilo ohms so one mega ohm component position cannot be missed get that soldered in place As always, take care when clipping these legs off. You don't want them pinging around all over the place because, believe me, they will find their way somewhere where they are certainly not wanted. The next component is the USB socket. You may think that this is going to be a challenge to solder on, and you're probably right, but it only needs the power connectors, so we don't need to concern ourselves too much about the little tiny pins. I would recommend tacking down the larger solder points first and then doing the two in the middle afterwards. A good challenge then for your soldering skills. Fortunately, it's only the outer two of the centre pins that need to be soldered down. Next, then, is the ceramic capacitor. It's not identified as such on the board, but it must go here. Lastly then is the electrolytic capacitor which is polarised, the longer lead being the positive. However there's no indication on the board here as to which is positive, it's just a square and a circle. The easiest way I think to work out which is positive and negative is just to plug 5 volts in on the USB connector there and then again with our multimeter, this time on volts, that's giving us minus 5 so clearly that is plus 5, the square is the positive side. Disconnect the power now, and the long positive leg of the capacitor will go in there. According to the instructions now, we have some hardware to install the 
screws and nuts that support the LEDs. I've put the screws in place. I'm not sure that they're going to help very much in installing the LEDs, as it said. I guess that the screws might be difficult to put in once the LEDs are in place. So go ahead and do that. The LEDs themselves, as I mentioned before, are three LEDs in one package, red, green and blue. There is one leg which is obviously longer than the others, so that will be common, but whether it's common positive or common negative, or common anode or common cathode, we don't know. What I'd use is one of these little button cells. This is the positive side, and you don't need a resistor when you use one of these. The internal resistance limits the current, so all we have to do is to put it across the LED, and then we will find which side makes it light, in which case this is the negative side on the longer lead, so this is a common cathode LED. If I now put it on this leg, we get the blue light. It's probably looking white in the, in the camera there. And then finally, the green. It may be an idea to test each of the LEDs. That will be tedious, but you don't want to get into the situation that maybe one of them doesn't work and it's right in the middle, which would be difficult to remove. When inserting the LEDs into the board, take care the longest leg needs to go where the little square is, and that is the common cathode point. Make sure that that goes in like so. In the instructions it says that the outermost ring of LEDs should be a height of 15 millimeters above the circuit board. We can check that there with our ruler, and that's as near as it makes no difference, 15 millimeters. And now plenty of soldering to do. To aid in the soldering process, I use one of these like helping hand devices, which has, are they alligator or crocodile clips? I guess it depends which side of the pond you're on. For me as a boy, they were crocodile clips. Either way, you need to put something over the end to stop it damaging the board. All I've done is to cut a piece of old lighting flex, remove the center cores, and just slip that over the end. Probably a good idea just to tack one of the legs down and then make sure that the thing is upright before soldering the remainder. With the outermost ring of LEDs installed at 15 millimeters height, we then have nine LEDs on the inner ring and then the final one in the center. And the heights for these, the inner ring, the top height around about 24 millimeters, and then the final one at 32 millimeters. The 32 millimeters gives us just enough of the pins to solder to. Let's get that done. Having soldered in all the LEDs, the last job to do is to solder in the main IC. Pin 1 is identified by a small dot next to pin 1, and there's a little U-shaped indent, which is indicated on the silk screen as well. When you've soldered all the LEDs, you've just done 112 solder joints, so these remaining 28 should be no trouble at all. We can see that the integrated circuit is going to sit above the solder joints of some of the LEDs, so make sure that those are cut nice and short. And unusually, we need to solder the pins from the top, as there's you could get to the outside ones, but not the inside ones easily.
with all the soldering complete, it's a good idea to give it a bit of a clean. I use IPA or isopropanol and just with an old toothbrush clean up the residue of the solder flux so that when you show your friends they'll be suitably impressed with your soldering. Not a bad job, I think you'll agree. Final thing to do then is to remove the protective film from the acrylic or perspex base. That could be easier said than done. Although they did supply extra LEDs, they didn't supply enough nuts. I'm sure I'll be able to find some in my spares box. And here we can see the finished result. Now you may ask yourself, what actually is the point of all this? Well, it's an exercise in your soldering skills and your general ability to identify components. People often say to me, oh, I'm very interested in learning electronics, but I don't really know where to start. Well, I have a, an entire playlist of beginner type projects like this, where you can choose a simple project. This is quite complex in terms of soldering, at least. Start off with something simple, but as with all things, the longest journey begins with the first step. If you never take that first step, then you'll never get anywhere. Time then to test the fruits of our labour. Probably get a better effect with the main lights out. With the festive seasons approaching, Halloween, etc., this will make a very colourful decoration, maybe in front of a mirror or something, or inside of a pumpkin for Halloween, who knows? I shall probably end up donating this to one of the local kids, and hopefully it may even inspire them to have a go at some electronics.